again, if you talk to most British people, okay, even, even today, uh, British people tend to have the sort of idea that Asia is divided into two parts, India and China. And the, the consciousness of the, the variety of cultures and the, the richness of cultures you find in Southeast Asia particularly, I think is still struggling against that sort of uh, idea. Um, so, you know, the, again, when I take Gamelan into schools, quite often I will start by saying, well, does anybody know where this is from? Always get kids put their hands up and go, Africa? Uh, China? India? India? No, they go, you can see them thinking, is there anywhere else? Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we're, we're slowly, you know, getting the message out. Um, it's, you know, it's the, the sort of whole point of this, this project is, is how things have gone from those sort of small beginnings to, yeah. to the way it is now. Um, so we're obviously making some sort of progress. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I came, I was so surprised. What, 100 yeah. gamelan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when did you move to Reading? Uh, I moved to Reading in 1999. There's sort of a bit missing when I was, I did a, a doctorate, a PhD in ethnomusicology at the School of Oriental and African Studies. So I. So I, yeah. Um, oh, with, uh, David with Hughes oh, David. was my, my supervisor, and Ben Arps was teaching at South at the time. He taught me Javanese. I was there in 2000. Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> also in music department? Or? Uh, I was teaching dance, and the right, music okay. department was organized. Yeah. Uh, I came at 99, at mm -hmm. the end of 99. Oh. And then I just, I just I finished by then. So, yeah, I, I uh, went out to do some field work uh, in Indonesia, Isi again, helped me go and do that. I was doing a bit of teaching of Western music for them. Um, and uh, then I was offered a job teaching English at, uh, at Majai University in Georgia. I did a year of that. And uh, it was there that I met uh, the lady who is uh, now my wife, that Maya. And uh, I went out again to get married in 97 in Georgia and taught a couple of years at her university, which is Sanata Dharma University in Georgia. And then we came back to England in 1999, uh, and uh, I got the job with, uh, with the BBC near Reading and moved to the Reading area. And um, we got to know the sort of local uh, Indonesian community. Um, we got some introductions to people and found that they're actually very well organised. They have this sort of thing called a Kampung Reading. They're very good at uh, um, organising you know, social events and charity fundraising events. We did one. We played Gamelan last year to raise money for the um, Padang earthquake appeal, um, which again was organised by Kampung Reading. And uh, they sort of found that I'd played gamelan and taught gamelan and had a gamelan and they, they kept sort of asking me, you know, almost as a joke, uh, so when are you going to teach us gamelan? You know, when, when are we going to get together and, and, and play gamelan as a, as a community, you know, the kampung gamelan? Um, and the trouble of always was finding somewhere to put it. It's space that's the, the issue with gamelan, unfortunately. I thought you were from in London. <laughs> no, it's anywhere you try and put a complete gamelan. Um, and eventually we, we met somebody who was involved in the local art scene in uh, near Reading, a place called Twyford, who sort of offered us space. So I then kind of went back to the community and said, right, we're going to start this January, you know, this was a few years ago now. We've been going, I can't remember how many years we've been going now. I think we've been going about five years as a group. Um, uh, and we started off with the idea of we get together and, uh, and you know, learn gamelan and have a tea break in the middle. And sometimes it shades into being a society that gets together to drink tea and occasionally play a bit of gamelan. So it's a very nice, uh, very nice community feel. It's like a group of friends coming together to play. Um, but uh, well, we'll, we'll play for you in a bit, but. Uh, I mean, technically, we we probably not the most brilliant gamelan in 
the UK. Um, but as I say, what's nice is we do have the, uh, the, the community feel to it, and I think we have more uh, Indonesians playing gamelan than any other, except arguably the Indonesian embassy. I don't know. Oh. Um, oh, that's a shame. Um, ah. There is no other Indonesian player only here. Ooh. <laughs> um, so I think because that's, that's a kind of, uh, I hate to use the word selling point because we're not selling anything. You know, you know we're, we're doing it because we love it. Um, the, we've been in, invited to play uh, at the South Bank um, a couple of times, three times now, I think, in total. Um, there's also a, a, an arts centre in Reading that has these... Uh, uh, sort of little world music, even sort of mini WOMAD, they call it, uh, evenings that we play for. Um, and we've done some events that are organised by uh, Campong Reading itself, the, the uh, um, fundraiser for the, for the earthquake uh, that we did last year. So, I mean, we, we, we get out to sort of perform occasionally. Um, we can bring... Uh, guests in to come and fill in some of the soft instruments and sindan and stuff like that. Um, the, there is still um, one thing I, I, I love about gamelan in general. It's true in Indonesia. It's true in Britain as well. Is that unlike some forms of music, uh, you think of things like in in Britain, some of the very popular. Uh, native forms of music like brass bands or male voice choirs. There's a very competitive element to it. And you have festivals which are competitions and they're judged and you get to win a trophy if you're the best. Um, that is entirely absent from Gamelan. Um, certainly in, uh, in, in this country, there's still, even though it's a much bigger scene than it was when I started, and, you know, people don't travel hundreds of miles for a gamelan event anymore because you can go to one locally for most people now. Um, there is still a, a, a sort of camaraderie. Uh, it's almost, I don't want to push the analogy, but it's almost like you get together with people from other, other churches or other mosques and there's a feeling that there's a there's a common layer of understanding there in in uh, in, in your religion. Um, so I don't want to push the analogy too far, but it's kind of like that with gamelan. You know, this person is also a fellow gamelan player, therefore they are my friend. Um, rather than they belong to a different gamelan, they are my competitor. I have to do better than them. I have to hate them. Uh, that you sometimes get with, with some of these more competitive forms of, uh, uh, of music in this country. Um, as I was saying, in the recent years when we have gone and played the, the South, it's nice because you, you meet old friends, you meet people you haven't seen for years who are there with other gamelans, and, and, and that's nice. And uh, I say there's also this feeling of, of being supportive of each other um, rather than in any kind of, of competition. <laughs> You've been doing lots of workshops. Yes, quite, quite a few, yeah. Uh, how do they take it? How do they...? <laughs> it depends on the school. Um, mostly very well. Um, there's always a sort of what, what we refer to as, as a wow factor involved in gamelan. The kids come in, they walk into the room, and there's the gamelan set out, and they go, wow! And if they're young enough, you've, you've got them then. And they'll go, oh, I want to play the gong. Can I go and play the gong? And then you go, oh, can't do that again. And that's brilliant. Um, I think anybody who teaches gamelan in schools will tell you the, the same thing, which is little kids, junior school kids. You're talking, usually about eight is the youngest you can take them because physically able to pick the beaters up and play and concentrate. From eight up to about you know, 11, 12, they're absolutely fantastic. They're brilliant. When they get to year nine, about 13, 14, 
that's the worst year to teach because they're all getting a bit adolescent and and they they you ask so who's going to come play first and they all look at each other going oh is this going to be cool to do what this mad bloke says or so they're a bit difficult. But when you get on to the year 10, 11, those are students who've chosen to do music. So being good at music and doing music is OK. It's cool for them. So anything from year 10 upwards, again, is fine. You can treat them as adults, and, and they're no problem at all. Um, so yeah, the, the, the vast majority of, of kids. We, we've also done some workshops in uh, um, special schools. For special needs, uh, and you know, depending on the, the level of those individual kids, sometimes all you can do is get them to to keep a beat. But for them, you can you can see that they're getting a lot out of that experience. Profoundly disabled uh, kids, and they can join in with the beat, and they can touch the instruments, the drums, and feel vibrations from it, and they 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 love that. Yeah, you can see how much they're, they're appreciating this, and that can be a very, very moving thing to do. Um, you know, just seeing the different sort of levels of, of ways in which people can engage with gamelan, um, from just enjoying the, the feel and the sound of the instruments to, you know, playing a relatively simple piece or a, one of the less complicated instruments in a group through to people who are really pushing themselves to. Uh, and I mean, again, in, in this group, Kampong Reading group, we have a gradient of, uh, how can I put it? It's a gradient of ambition, put it that way. Some people are content just to play Balungan and to be part of the, that's enough for them. And again, that's a brilliant thing about Gamelan. You don't have to push people beyond the level that they're comfortable with. Um, people who are ambitious and want to have a go can push themselves and do something a bit more, more challenging. Um, so again, that, that, I think that's another good thing that helps to keep a sort of community spirit to it. We're not a class that's got definite learning goals. Um, although, if people want to go to a class with definite learning goals, that's fine too. You know, that's, a, that's something the South Bank caters for uh, very well. So, yeah. I want to go back to your group here. Mm -hmm. um, quite a lot of them are Indonesian. Yes. Um, what do they do in daily life? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we can ask them later. One is a manager for uh, the Royal Mail. One uh, is a biochemist working research. Uh, another one is a university lecturer teaching veterinary medicine. Um, We've got several people sort of in Kampung Reading. Uh, I don't know, again, if this is reflected more widely with, with Indonesian communities around the world. There tends to be, generally, you have more women than men. And uh, the, uh, a, a lot of the women will be Indonesian women married to British men, as my wife and I are. You know. um, so we've got uh, somebody who plays regularly who's is married to a British man, so she lives here you know, with her husband. So the group is uh, male and female? Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> we don't have enough players to be uh, selective on the grounds of gender. Now, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I don't have a... Are they good? Are they performing? Hmm. Yes. 